Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are grateful. We are grateful for the gathering of the believers and the worship. We ask you to receive from us what we are giving to you, Lord. And it is not, of course, that you get something from us that we can add to you. But Lord, in our worship, would you be glorified? And as we think about that theme today, and as we talk about that in your word, we ask you, Lord, to bless and anoint this time. We're so grateful, Lord, as we have already prayed for the dads who have had influence in our lives and as we honor them today, but we are also mindful of those who have had difficult relationships or maybe never knew uh, their own fathers, and yet, Lord, you are the perfect heavenly Father, and you promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. And for that, we worship and glorify your name today. And so we ask your blessing now as we open up to the Psalms and receive the encouragement that you have for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. What We have gone, what, three weeks without rain, and now all of a sudden there's clouds in the sky and wet stuff falling from the sky. Like I kind of felt like saying, what is this? Uh, Wet stuff that's coming from the sky. You know, I, I looked at my, my weather app, and, and there's a chance we could have a thunderstorm during the service. It's possible. And we're going to talk about thunder today, believe it or not. Anyway, so last week we talked about why worship matters. If you were here or you're watching online, why worship matters. And we concluded that we become what we behold. Remember that part? Yeah. Keith does. We become what we behold. We, we turn into what we adore, is another way of saying it. What do you adore? Today we'll be discussing worship and how we grow through worship together as the body of Christ through encouragement in the Psalms, how God strengthens us through the gathering of believers and the prayer and praises of His people. If you're feeling a little weary or fatigued, I was talking to someone before the service, and they were saying, you know, my neighbors were loud last night. I didn't get any sleep is kind of how it went. And, uh, and, and I just sensed sense some weariness. I was feeling that myself. If, if you're in that spot today, this is certainly for you. If you've ever said to yourself, I just need more more energy. I just need more strength. This is for you. We're going to be in Psalm 29 today. The word psalm actually is transliterated word from the Hebrew, and that just means it sounds like um, the word songs. This is a song, a song of worship that was written by King David back in the time of King David. That, that's a, a year to date for you. Uh, psalm 29, I want to read this for you, and then uh, I want to... Uh, Dig a little deeper. Uh, again, a song of worship. It says, and if you want to follow along, love if you would, uh, the words also will be f before you on the screen. Ascribe, that means give. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and, what does it say there? Strength. There's our theme. Strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His majesty. The voice of the Lord is over, it's above, over the waters. The God of glory thunders, thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. We talked about that last week. Majesty being the beauty and the awe and the splendor of God. The voice of the Lord, continuing with this theme, breaks the cedars, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. This would be the hill country, the mountains that are north of Israel where David and, and Solomon brought the wood for the building of the temple and the palace, uh, the, the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. That's the power of God. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf. That's as if to say the mountains jump when His voice thunders. And it says, and the Syrian, like a young wild ox, that's actually an extinct animal, but one that, of course, was around in David's day. Verse 7, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. What happens in a thunderstorm? There's lightning, right? And with lightning sometimes comes forest fires, especially in this region of the world. The voice of the Lord shakes 
the wilderness. I've felt that before. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give, what does it say? Strength. Strength. May the Lord give us strength. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. That's the word shalom, of course, with peace. Let's start in verse 1, shall we? Is that all right? Verse 1, we'll start at the beginning. Give to God glory, you heavenly beings. Now, what that actually literally means is, if you were just to translate that literally, it, it means mighty sons or sons of might. And so it could be speaking of angels, as the ESV renders, or it could be speaking of those who are in mighty places, like the kings of the earth. It's as if to get the attention of those who have some power on this earth, or just those of us who think we're all that. He's saying, give to God true glory that is due His name. In other words, you aren't what you think you are. Give to God what He is. Think about this, though. When we give to God, as I prayed before we started, when we worship and pray and praise and glorify and serve, we're not adding to what God is or what He needs, right? As if He needs something from us. We're not adding to Him, right? But in fact, when we give glory to God, we're acknowledging the truth of who He is and what He has done. And the outcome of that is not that God has changed. God doesn't change. God is true yesterday, today, and forever, right? But instead, we are changed. Not Him. We receive something. That's not our purpose, but we do receive something. Our desires and our preferences and our values change. And strength upon strength is built in order that we would be able to withstand what life throws at us. Which certainly, in in poetic nature, David is speaking to the storms of life. And although our circumstances may not change, the Lord will bring us through according to His plan, according to His will. Spiritually speaking, what makes us What makes us weak and fatigued? I mean, obviously something like lack of sleep does. But but spiritually speaking, think about it for a second. What makes us spiritually tired? Think about that for a second. How about this? Trying to do things on our own strength. Do you agree? Trying to live the Christian life on our own strength, trying to be a good person, not, not in the spirit of God and, 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 and good works according to what He is leading us, but you know, trying to do the right thing on your own strength. Or maybe it's this, I, I, I don't need the help of God yet. That's doing things on our own strength. I, you know, I'll, I'll pray when things get really tough. Or I'll go to the Lord after I've kind of made my decision. We do that, don't we? That's trying to do things on our own strength. Or how about this one? Not taking time to rest. Sometimes we, uh, sometimes we speak of Sundays being Sabbath, right? And, and, and Sabbath is stopping, pausing, and giving glory to God. It's why we're... We're here. Now, you can have Sabbath not just on Sundays. You can do that on Saturdays, and you can do it other days of the week. But do we pause, do we stop, and do we go to God? Sabbath worship matters. Another way of looking at it is, are are we even prepared to rest on a Sunday morning? Are, Are we even prepared to receive what God has for us, to strengthen us, so that we can receive His strength? Trying to do things on our own strength. Not taking time for Sabbath. How about this one? Not getting spiritually fed. I'm thinking about going to His Word. You know, when we neglect the Word of God. 
we grow fatigued and tired. You know, I eat three meals a day, or at least two. You probably as well, right? What about your spiritual sustenance, right? Three meals a day, maybe, maybe not. Spiritually speaking, we need not neglect the Word of God. I said it last week, we need to be reminded of who God is and who we are and and how that informs our lives. With all the chaos in the world and in our lives, it's easy to forget the We talked about it last week, the majesty of God. Even in the day-to-day, it's easy to forget our very purpose, which is to glorify God. Uh, Look with me back at verse 9. If you want to throw up on the screen there again, verse 9, if you can find it quickly. You know, if you've lost focus, or or you've fallen away, so to speak, God will get your attention if He so chooses. Believe me, listen to... Verse 9 again, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. You know, they weren't planning on having that calf that day. (laughs) But boy, God got their attention. The voice of the Lord whips things into shape and causes certain things. And then it goes on to say, strips the forest bare like like a forest fire after a lightning strike. And in his temple, all cry. He got their attention. All cry, glory, glory to God. Yes, like a storm causing an animal to go into labor. David says, this is the strength of the voice of God. There's seven descriptions of the voice of God, all speaking to his strength. The picture we are given here, of course, is a thunderstorm. In fact, the entire poem or song is about a thunderstorm. The word voice here in the text is from the Hebrew word kol, which can be translated voice as it is here, or just sound, but it's really about a sound, and that sound being thunder as the heavens thunder. I like like storms. Of course, not really bad storms. That's a little frightening, of course. I've been camping before and had a storm come in and, and, and literally knock the trees for for trees crashing down and had to jump in our car and, and drive out of this forested area. It was you know, quite a scary ordeal, but the point being, not quite storms that way, but isn't there something very beautiful, too, about storms? You know, when, when, when in the middle of the summer when we need a good thunderstorm, do you ever open up the windows and just listen to it? I, I have some family members who live on the West Coast, and uh, one of them who, who grew up there told me, I couldn't believe this, told me they had never heard a real thunderstorm. It's kind of a boring area of the United States. Anyway, and I thought, you have really missed out. Anyway, if you ever opened up your window and just heard that storm rumbling in, you you get where David is going with this. Both the beauty and the, the frightening nature of a storm, the power and the strength, like the hair raising on the back of your neck, and yet also the the beauty and the majesty. Verse 4, it talks about majesty. Why is it important to acknowledge that the voice of God is strength? It might be an obvious question, but I want us to ponder it for a second, because there are some voices of chaos in the world that want to drown out the voice of God, the God who is almighty. There is trouble and there is chaos and there is lawlessness and there is violence. Any storm of life could could point to this. The psalm is not saying God is a God of chaos. Although, if at first glance you saw that, you might think, "So, so who is God in all of this? No, he's not saying God is a God of chaos. It's showing us, if you read it carefully, that his power is greater than the chaos. And let me tell you how important that is for us to hear today. God is greater than your chaos. And I don't know what's going on in your life, but God does. I don't know what's going on in your mind, but God does. 
God is greater than the chaos of your mind, the hurt and the pain. God is greater than the chaos. I I think about what's going on in our city. God is greater than the chaos in our city, what's going on in our nation. God is greater than the lawlessness in our world. God is greater than it all. Is that not a comfort to us? Just raise your hand if that's a comfort to you, because it certainly is a comfort to me. I walked into the office today and looked in my mailbox, and and there was this, this magazine that I get, and it just said, with all of the chaos in our world today. That's just the start. That's just the headline. And I thought, man, not the only one feeling that. Not the only one talking about this. There's a lot of chaos, and yet God is over this. Disorder and confusion, it takes a lot out of us. It causes fear and anxiety, and we have to be careful what we listen to and how often we listen to it. But uncertainty doesn't sit well with us. It threatens our well-being. It causes division. And yet, we realize in a text like this that God is greater than it. King David so brilliantly is connecting things of heaven with pictures of earth. And just like we talked about last week, you can't really do justice to how we can describe the might of God, but he's beginning to do it in this poetic and worshipful manner. But it's not just something. I want us to realize this. This is not just something about God. It's not just a description of God. There's more to it. Because this is worship. Remember, this is a song of worship. Worship involves God in that what we do on earth in worship, in the presence of God, get this, is a glimpse of things that are greater. Is a glimpse of things that are eternal and almighty. You know, we don't always treat worship this way. In fact, sometimes we just go through the, what? Motions in worship. That's not just in our gathering, but we do this, don't we? We don't always treat worship this way, but it is. It's something more. Worship involves God and involves the body of Christ. It's one of the reasons the Bible commands us to sing in worship. Speaking of voices, we're speaking of God's voice, but speaking of voices, of course, using our voices to make melody is not the only form of worship. In fact, to sing is not the worship time. That's not worship in itself, because what is worship? Worship is our being adoring Jesus Christ. That's what worship, true worship is. But let's just talk about singing for a second. When we sing glory to God, like the psalm says, just like the angels sang announcing the birth of Jesus, just like children sang at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem before his crucifixion and resurrection, just like the angels are singing in heaven as we speak, when we worship Jesus, we proclaim glory to God, and we're joining the choirs in heaven for eternity. Just as Jesus said, for your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in what? Heaven. I've got to say, some people love to sing. You can't stop them. Others, not so much. Might be speaking to a couple of dads on Father's Day. I don't know if singing is your thing. I don't know what it looks like in worship. Because I sit in the front, I can't watch you. (laughs) But let me just say, for some people, singing is everything to them. For others, they only sing when no one else is listening. (laughs) But why do we sing? And does it matter, and what's the point? I want to take you to Ephesians 5. Go there real quick if you have a Bible. You'll also see it before you. Because it it says something very unique. And what the Apostle Paul is doing here is actually tying together what David was foretelling of what was to come through his own family line in Jesus Christ. And how worship relates. And he says this in verse 18, And do not... Get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, that's lawlessness, that's it's actually saying that's chaos. But be filled with the Spirit. 
addressing one another. Here's what it looks like. Verse 19. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your... What does it say? With your heart. Notice how it says hymns and spiritual songs. 8.30 service and 10.30 service. Okay, maybe. Okay, maybe I'm reading into that. Anyway, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. There's something about the heart and singing. Music moves us. Believe me, it moves us. Music is something God created and the choirs of heaven have been making melody since they were created. And when we join together with the choirs of heaven, something happens in our hearts. God is doing something in worship. Look at verse 20. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When it says giving thanks always, what it's really saying is this. You know, you're not always going to feel like worshiping. You're not always going to feel thankful. But when you do it, something happens, right? Have you ever been grumpy? Come on now. Have you ever been grumpy and just said, you know, I have a lot to be thankful for? You ever done that? And then you just had a different attitude? You know, sometimes, and that's what that's why we've been going to the Psalms. That's what this is about. You know, things have been difficult this year, and yet we're, we're pausing and we're saying, you know what, though? We have so much to be thankful for. God is God. And there's nothing I like preaching on more than the might and the strength of God. Because when I recognize that strength, it does something in my heart. It says then in verse 21, last verse of Ephesians 5, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's emotion in this. You might not like singing out loud, or maybe you do. But what it's getting at is that your life is about adoration to God if Jesus has redeemed you. If Jesus is in your heart, then you you have a song to sing. It's very poetic to even say, but it's it's what it's speaking to. It means your heart has a, has a song to sing. The believer has a song of redemption, of hope, of endurance, of strength, and the might of the Lord giving thanks together. That's different than just having devotions on your own. Giving thanks together and, and praising God, that's, that's different than even just sitting and taking in the, the sermon. We are, in a sense, doing something together. Just like Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, and that's the gospel Without wavering, we we waver out of weakness when we lack strength. But then it says this, for he who has promised is faithful. He's the one who's faithful. He's the one who will see us through. And then it says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, not neglecting the fellowship of the church, but stirring one another up. That's emotion, right? And of course we're not talking about emotionalism. We're not trying to conjure up emotions, fake them, that sort of thing. That's emotionalism. Emotionalism in worship is not good. However, emotions are an important part of our lives and therefore our worship. Imagine something amazing happen. Like the day my, my sons or daughter were born. Imagine me having no emotion on that day. Oh, I had lots. And so did my wife. <laughs> Just thinking about Father's Day. Imagine an emotionless dad on the day his kids are born. No, I had emotions. Why? Because I cared. Because I couldn't believe what was happening, right? Emotions are an important part of our life. To stir, to stir one another up is to influence, to love and good works. And this is an important part of what we're doing here. And without worship, we lack something in our lives. What is true worship according to the Bible, is that the adoration of God spills over in our lives and spills onto everyone else, and we influence one another together for the glory of God. It's a beautiful picture of the beauty of God at work and His might at work in our lives. I don't know about you, 
but we spend a whole lot of energy on things that matter very little for eternity. A lot of the strength and might of ourselves is spent on a whole lot of things that have nothing to do with eternity, like things, like work, like entertainment. And they in themselves aren't wrong, but that tells us something about what we adore. And, and maybe I'll just speak specifically to dads or the guys today. You know, sometimes I wonder what our kids, what our grandkids, what those around us see in us in worship. What do they observe in our lives about what we adore? But of course it goes for all of us. Why do we worship, praise, and adore? Because God changes our hearts as we shift our focuses on things that matter the most. And he unites us, the body of Christ, and delivers us from the chaos of this world as he sustains us through his strength, not ours. And i got to tell you, I need that strength today. I'm not sure where the chaos in your life resides, but the Lord knows. And he's greater and he's stronger than any voice, any storm, anything that's going on in your life. And if you're not going through a storm right now, if everything's perfect, <laughs> you can be assured that storms will come. And when they do, you'll need a shelter and you'll need an anchor. And it's in times like these where you do not want to be holding on to something that cannot sustain you. It's in times like these that you need the mighty voice of God. We need the mighty voice of God and its comfort if we are going to walk through what life is throwing at us right now. And yet in that, there's this great comfort and hope that just as he has redeemed us, we will one day stand before him fully redeemed. Knowing that in him, hope was never lost. Whatever life threw at us never overtook us because our assurance is in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm so glad that you are our strength, that we're not doing this on our own, that you never called your church to live for you and unto you by our own doing. But instead, you sent your Son from heaven to earth. And you sent him for one purpose, and that was to redeem his people. And Lord, as we would know in our hearts your redemption and receive the forgiveness that you offer us because of our sins, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us strength. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the strength that you offer us through our heavenly Father. And Lord, we proclaim your might and your strength over all that's going on in our lives, in our city, and in our world today. We pray together that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done and that we would be ready. So, Lord Jesus, do that work in us now. And for those who are weak and who are weary, I ask you to give them strength. For those who are sorrowing, I ask you to give them an extra measure of strength today. And, Lord Jesus, I pray that as their hope is restored, you would strengthen their faith. Because as we await you, you restore us, Lord. For you have purposes even, even beyond the chaos. Because even in what we are facing, Lord, you will be glorified. And for that we say, praise be to Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, we pray 
that you would continue to do that work in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen.